Hello, I'm Kathleen Dunn on the Ideas Network of Wisconsin Public Radio. Our guest this hour is the author of Islam and the Arab Awakening. And he is joining us by phone today from Qatar. Uh, we'll find out what he's doing there momentarily. He is uh, Tariq Ramadan. He is a professor of Islamic studies at Oxford University and is author of the aforementioned book, he is also um, president of the European think tank, European Muslim Network, which is located in Brussels. He has uh, degrees in philosophy and French literature, a Ph.D. in Arabic and Islamic studies from the University of uh, Geneva. And in Cairo, Egypt, he received one-on-one -on -one intensive training in classic Islamic scholarship. He wrote a piece in the New York Times which sort of frames what we're talking about this hour that appeared on September 30th. I quote, during a recent visit to the U.S., he was asked by intellectuals and journalists, were we misled during the Arab awakening into thinking that Muslims could actually embrace democratic ideals? The short answer, he says, is no. Participants in the recent violent demonstrations over an Islamophobic video were a tiny minority. Violence was unacceptable and it doesn't represent the millions of Muslims who have taken to the streets since 2010 in a disciplined, nonviolent manner to bring down tick dictatorships. We will be welcoming phone calls for Tariq Ramadan. Our phone number is 800-486-8655, 800-486-8655. Email talk at WPR.org. Facebook is The Kathleen Dunn Show. Tariq Ramadan, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, Thanks our, a lot. Uh, yeah, our great pleasure. Where are you right now? I am in Qatar. Qatar and uh, okay, that's I always like to know and where Dubai, people are. Capital, yeah. yeah, thank you very much for yeah. being with us. Let's go to Tunisia. You start your book looking at the events of December seventeenth of two thousand ten and what happened when public protests broke out. Why did they break out initially in Tunisia, and why in two thousand ten? I think that there are many factors that we have to take into account. First, it's clear that in Tunisia and Egypt, uh, the ingredients for, uh, you know, social uh, uprisings and people not being uh, uh, happy with what was happening were clear because what we had is, you know, uh, poverty, corruption, and unemployment, and, and people being very, it was very difficult for people to cope with the situation. Now, what is important also, and this is where I'm saying we have to be very cautious not to be too quick in analyzing and thinking that it came all of a sudden from the people. What we knew before it, I, I tried to do when I was writing the book is to come back to what were the facts that we knew uh, before it happened. And this is where I discovered that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, many uh, administrations, the youth administration, but also the European administration, and even the dictators themselves, they knew about young people being trained in uh, social networks, on Internet, uh, in Eastern Europe, in uh, the West, in even in the United States of America. Someone like, for example, Serja Popovic, uh, who was behind the whole mobilization uh, against Milosevic, was training people, and this was known. So the point is that it happened beyond the political affiliations, beyond all the groups, by people who were just mobilizing people in a nonviolent protest against the dictator. And it worked exactly because of that, because they were not uh, linked to a specific... You know, a, a political group or political party or political or ideology, like for example, political Islam, they were beyond this and they were gathering the people and pushing the people with only one slogan uh, to the dictator: "Get out! We don't want you, and we are not happy with the with the the system." So I think that we have to understand that there is multiple factors that were gathered uh, in. 2010 that made it possible for the people to uh, mobilize uh, against the dictator. And tell me more about this. People were being trained. How were they being trained? What were they being trained to do and where were they being trained? So this is a very important question because now we know, and if you, you, you read what was published by the Time magazine in July, where all the people were uh, very supportive of 
the Syrian opposition, we read in the Time magazine exactly what I was saying to the two years before about what happened before. Egyptian uh, and the Tunisian uh, demonstrations is that they were uh, trained, the department was uh, financing and some institution, Freedom House in the United States of, uh, of America, the uh, uh, um, uh, Albert Einstein Institute were putting money to uh, finance and to support training of bloggers and cyber dissidents. Some mm. of them came to the United States, others were trained in uh, Eastern Europe. And in fact, they were trained to know how to use internet with a very important philosophy. And this is what was written by Serja Popovich and all the people who were working around him about nonviolent mobilization, which was very clear that, you know, the slogans should be very positive. It should be beyond the political affiliation. It should be against the dictator. You have some symbols like, like for example, the clenched fists and, and very positive. And, and this is what we saw from the very beginning. Nothing against the West, nothing against the United States of America and the st- but the, all the slogans were mainly and uh, all you know against the, the dictator, and it has to be uh, uh, nonviolent. And this is something that uh, is part of the whole philosophy: using the social networks and trying to to mobilize the people. And in 2010, in September 2010, a very important network of uh, Middle Eastern bloggers was set in Budapest, and this was financed by Google. And uh, the people who were there, were, some of them were very much involved in everything which was happening through the social networks in, uh, in Tunisia and in Egypt. So we need to know this. Does it mean that it's a conspiracy? No. I think that it was quite clear that what George W. Bush said in 2003 that the United States of America were pushing towards democratization in the region. He was uh, true he, to his word. And with the Barack Obama, I think that the, 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 the vision uh, in the region was important, even though the United States were for years and decades supportive of Barack's regime and Ben Ali's regime. At one point, it was clear that uh, uh, these regimes were at the end, uh, and they were, you know, Ben Ali and Mubarak were very old. And most importantly, something that we haven't talked about in the whole process, we are obsessed with the political structure and talking about democratization and everything, which is, are we going to have Islamist and and, yes. or, or secularist. The point is that what is important in the region is not very much the political systems, because as I'm talking to you now, the United States of America are still dealing with petrol monarchies, even with you know uh, the United uh, with Saudi Arabia or even Qatar. They are not democracies. They don't really care. They more they care much more about their interests, and these are protected interests. The point was that uh, we had new actors in the region that were becoming very dangerous for the stability and interest of the West. Uh, And we can say the BRIC uh, countries, Brazil, China, India, uh, Russia, uh, Turkey now, South Africa, these are countries that are now playing a very important role in the region. And this is why the United States and even the European uh, countries had to change their policy in the region. Let's talk a little bit about the overlapping of religion and politics. Uh, You write about this struggle for political and religious authority taking place in uh, societies, and there are deep divisions, you write, among Sunnis, traditionalists, secularists, reformers, Sufi mystics, also between Sunnis and Shiites. How is that playing out? How do we need to understand that? What do we know about that? I think this is a very important uh, reality here. If we are not, uh, if we don't understand what is happening in the Muslim majority country, we are not going to to, to understand what are the, the challenges of. And this is what I'm saying in the book: is that if you look at the Sunni tradition now, 
uh, what we find with the Sunni tradition is that what we are now uh, witnessing in Tunisia or in Egypt is different trends uh, that are struggling for religious authority. And, and you can see that, for example, the literalist Salafi, who are not uh, jihadists, they are literalist and conservative, are now trying to find a place in the new uh, society and the new civil uh, uh, power and the civil society. So they are very much uh, using, you know, populist uh, attitudes. And this, these people were behind, you know, some of the demonstrations that we had uh, against the videos in, in, uh, in uh, Egypt and in, uh, in Tunisia or in Pakistan or Indonesia. They are pushing to say we are very Muslim and, and we are truly Muslim when we are against the West and the West doesn't like Islam and look at what they are doing with our prophet and, and, and the messenger they are uh, ridiculing religion. So this is something which which is important because even the people who are in power now, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt or Hezbun Nahba, uh, uh, meaning you know, the, 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 the Islamists in Tunisia, uh, they are now in a very difficult situation because they have to prove two things to the West that they are able to cope with contemporary challenges and to their people that they are religiously uh, uh, a reference and, and that they can be trusted on this. Mm -hmm. So you have this trend look and, and you also have you know other trends like the Sufi tradition, the more secularist, the rationalist. So there are tensions as to the religious authority and then you have beyond this a polarization between uh, uh, the Islamists and the secularists. And what I'm advocating in the book is that this is a trap. This is where you have Islamists trying to show that they have, they are the guardian of religion and they are struggling against the secularists. And the secularists are responding by saying, we are uh, uh, modernist, we are progressive, and you are backward coming back to religion. And then Every uh, group is finding its own justification against the other, while the true and important challenges of our time when it comes to corruption, education, social justice, uh, they are not tackling the real issues. They are just struggling for a kind of symbolic power, which is not tackling the true challenges and, and problems. As you uh, well know, our television screens and our discussion in the United States has been filled recently with showing the participants in violent demonstrations over this video uh, who you have talked about as being a tiny minority. What do you think of the way we are dealing with the complexity of this issue, which you just outlined? Why do we concentrate on those kinds of protests? Are there other movements that we need to pay more attention to um, and, and give us a better understanding of those protests, because obviously television cameras are going to go to where there are demonstrations and make a big thing of it. I think that this is a, a crucial question you are asking, because what is happening in the, the Muslim majority country is, you know, there is a the huge... Uh, majority is a silent majority and the people who want to build and they're trying to you know in fact in fact the real image that we should get of Muslims in the West are not people who are destroying you know we are obsessed with people like bin Laden and he was on his own with few people destroying and we are forgetting millions of Muslims who for example were taking to the streets in Egypt and Tunisia who were non-violent and ready to be killed without using weapons for the sake of freedom and justice. So why do we focus and are obsessed with the few that are destroying and not getting the right image of people who are like you and me, uh, trying to, to live and to get uh, 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 to survive and to get a, a good life. This is Islam and this, uh, these were Muslims. So it's as if sometimes we have a distorted image. Now, does it mean that we, have, we, we should uh, forget about these people? No. The Muslim majority countries are facing something which is everywhere in our contemporary world, which is the way populists are dealing with politics. It's less 
about uh, it's no longer about you know ideas and vision and political uh, vision or uh, social policies or economic policies is much more about emotional politics is just to build everything on fear and rejection of the other so we have religious populists now who are trying to to get this uh, emotions out of the people in the street saying, look, uh, we are Muslims again in the West, but these are a tiny minority. It's as if today I was judging uh, the United States of America through the eyes of some of the you know, neocons that you may some from the Tea Party who are building all of, for example, the, the, the pastor uh, who uh, uh, said this uh, 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 burning of Koran day uh, as if this was America. It's not. These are people who are not representing, but they are populists trying to deal with the fears of the people and thinking that we will get the people by rejecting the others, and especially Islam for in the West. Uh, and we are dealing. I can tell you, I'm a European. I am a Western Muslim. I'm um, dealing day in, day out with populists who are trying to spread around this fear of Islam. And on the other side, we have exactly the same in Muslim majority countries. And you and me and others who are trying to, to find a way to live together and who are promoting shared universal values. We are caught between these two uh, extremes, these two uh, kind of people who are nurturing fears while we are trying to get more, you know, uh, a reasonable approach. It doesn't mean that we are compromising our values, mm. but we are are not dealing with them through emotions. Mm -hmm. And yet it's no wonder that we became obsessed with bin Laden because the enormity of the damage that he inflicted on the United States, it, it, he killed a lot of people. Of course, but once again, uh, you, you have people telling you in the Muslim majority countries, and what about the United States? What uh, was done in Iraq and what is now not done in Syria and in the way the United States were supporting, you know, dictators because at the end of the day, Mubarak was supported by the U.S. administration. Mm -hmm. So it's not the time to count our victims. Mm. The time should come for us to stand for our values and principles and to come together and to say, look, me as a Muslim and I as a Muslim scholar, what I have to do is to be self-critical and to say to some of the Muslims now who are dealing with populism and some who are literalists, what you are doing is not my religion. You are acting uh, against my religion mm -hmm. and against my principles. And I'm going to say it, and I'm going to stand for that. At the same time, we need also people, uh, American citizens or Western citizens, to stand up and to ask their governments, like I am doing as a Western citizen, for more consistency. We cannot speak about dignity for ourselves and treat people with no dignity. Because at the end of the day, if you listen to the rhetoric that we have coming from uh, sometimes what is said in the, the Western media or what is said by some Western politicians, it's as if the blood of the Arabs and the blood of the Muslims is less valuable than the blood of our American soldiers in, in Afghanistan, for example. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, that cannot be acceptable. We have to be consistent with our values. We're going to welcome phone calls. Tariq Ramadan is our guest this hour, joining us by phone from Qatar. He is the author of Islam and the Arab Awakening, which has just been published and is worth examination. Uh, our phone number, we have a number of people who would like to speak to him. We're going to go to phone calls momentarily, 800-486-8655. 800-486-8655. You can also send an email if you would like to do that. That's talk at WPR.org. And uh, you can go to our Facebook page as well, The Kathleen Dunn Show. This is the Ideas Network of Wisconsin Public Radio. Tonight, the second presidential debate. I will at some point, or you can ask Tariq Ramadan about how foreign affairs is entering the presidential discussion and what he might like to see concentrated on tonight or during the next debate. Uh, so a couple reminders. One is the debate will be broadcast tonight on the Ideas Network. It's at 8 o'clock this evening. And tomorrow we're doing, we did this uh, four years ago and had a had a great time. Tomorrow we'll be watching the debate uh, tonight. We're getting very close to the presidential election. Joy Cardine and I will both be broadcasting our shows from the Paps Theater. It's actually the Paps Cudahy Pub on Wells Street in downtown Milwaukee, a couple blocks from where 
I am right now. Joy's coming in from Madison. So it's a full five hours of political discussion. It should be terrific. We have great panels lined up for you, terrific guests. And, of course, as part of the studio audience, you can engage in the political discussion, which should be fast and furious tomorrow after a presidential debate. No better day to come and see us. It's a free event. You can come by any time between 6 a.m. and 11 o'clock a.m. We'd love to know if you're coming so we have enough, I've been told to say, pastries. I thought there would be donuts, but I think there will be a few donuts and some pastries and coffee and lots of great conversation. Learn more and register at WPR.org slash Milwaukee. We hope to see you there. It should be a great morning. WPR.org slash Milwaukee. This is tomorrow at the Pabst. All right, we go to phone calls. Our guest this hour is the author of Islam and the Arab Awakening. Tariq Ramadan is joining us. And let's start our phone calls with Kasser, is it, in Germantown. Hello. Yes, uh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, uh, my question to your guest is, um, we have two main branches of uh, Islam. One is Shiism and the other one is uh, Sunnism. Now, if you look at the Sunnism, uh, it has many further branches. And, and I would like to ask the guest, is it a time that we should scrutinize Wahhabism, which is the official religion of or the belief system of the uh, Saudi royal family and official religion of uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Is it time that, and, and whatever, the, all the problems we are seeing in the world, including Taliban and Al-Qaeda, they are the offshoots of the Wahhabi beliefs. Is it time that as Muslims, which I am a Muslim, we should scrutinize Wahhabism and, 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 and bring to light the, the, you know, the official terrorism of the royal family of Saudi Arabia, because, you know, this girl that was uh, 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 shot in Pakistan uh, 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 this, this week, uh, she's not the only one. 40,000 Pakistanis have been killed by the Taliban, and in, that included thousands of young girls and boys. We didn't talk about it because a bomb blew up and 150 people got killed. Nobody cared, but, but the number mattered. She became a symbol. And, and just the way Bin Laden became a symbol of terrorism, she became the symbol of liberty and the women's rights. And we, the, the Taliban are fully, till today, are supported officially and official, unofficially by the, by the Saudis. Is it time that we should highlight Wahhabism and both in the U.S. and the rest of the world, we should discuss what Wahhabism is and what their beliefs are, all right, Tari Ramadan. Yes, it, it's a, it's a good question, even though it's not as simple as that. Uh, uh, Wahhabism, is, in fact, is not the right word. We are using it in the media, outside academia, but the right word is Salafi. In fact, they call themselves Salafi, and they are literalists. Now we have different types of literalists. You have uh, literalists and conservatives who are very much conservative in moral terms and not very much in, in, uh, uh, involved in politics. And we have now some literalists that are involved in politics and others who are even Salafi jihadists who are extreme. And we have to differentiate between all these trends. Now, what is said by, by, uh, through the question is, do we have to talk about this? Yes. And on my website, if you go on my website, it was published on, in eight uh, uh, languages. I, was, I sent a call to the contemporary Muslim conscience, asking the scholars and the intellectuals to stand up and to talk. Uh, it's good to be, you know, uh, uh, nonviolent. It's more important to be vocal. It's to be vocal, nonviolent Muslims should be uh, talking about uh, uh, this situation and being able to challenge their own people by saying that's not right and, uh, and, and, and to say where we de disagree. Now, if someone is a conservative without being involved in politics and killing people, I would accept that this is your choice. You are a conservative for yourself in your daily life. Now, what we have seen over the last few years, the last five years, is people being much more involved in politics in Egypt, in Tunisia, uh, and we knew of 
Saudi Arabia, and then they are pushing in that way. And we have to be. I cannot enter Saudi Arabia myself because I'm very critical. I'm saying this is not right. What you are doing is wrong, and uh, it has nothing to do with justice. And I'm even critical for, for uh, to, about all the the, the petromonarchies, even uh, critical about you know Qatar and others by saying uh, things that are for me necessary to be said in order to go towards more freedom and more democratization. Having said that now, this is the first step and we have to do this. But we cannot stop here. We have to go further than this because to be uh, uh, living in the West and to speak about you know, the Taliban and the, uh, and the Salafi in the same way is wrong. First, the Taliban are perceived by the Salafi as people who are innovators. They just help them uh, against the Russian presence. And who pushed them to help uh, uh, the Taliban at that time. And this is why we also have, this is why I was talking about consistency. Uh, this is the United States of America. It's well known now that during the 90s, uh, the Taliban were pushed by the Saudi and the Americans to be the first force to resist the Russian presence. Mm -hmm. Who is now uh, uh, allied, uh, the, uh, the allies of, of uh, the petromonarchies and the Gulf countries now uh, for the sake of their uh, economic interests and geostrategic interests? All the Western countries and now even China and Russia, they are uh, ready to talk to these people. So, so if we want to confront these people and to say uh, it's wrong, as Muslims, this is a moral duty. We have to do it and we have to stand up and to say this kind of Islam is a reduction, is uh, uh, not the, 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 the understanding of Islam that we are struggling for and standing for. At the same time, we also have to say to all the countries, please, it might be for the sake of your uh, 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 interest now, but on the long run, it's not going to help us in the world to support these trends. Mm -hmm. Tariq, as you well know, tonight is the second presidential debate here in the United States. Big election coming up three weeks from today. What seems to be dominating our news headlines, and I'm sure will be asked tonight, is uh, security and whether or not it was sufficient in Benghazi. What do you think we need to be talking about in this country during this campaign? Do we need to go beyond that issue? Is that an important issue for us to be debating in this country? Of course, it's important. At the end of the day, an ambassador was killed, and this has nothing to do with uh, with uh, the video. It has to do with what happened uh, in the struggle against terrorism in the region, and this was a kind of retaliation against the United States. And uh, by the way, the, the American amb ambassador who was killed was a good person. He was a good person, really. Mm -hmm. And to, to see him being killed is just a, a shame. And this is uh, very, very worrying and disappointing. At the same time, just to reduce the, for the American foreign policy to the consequences of this foreign policy, it's not going to help because at the end, this insecurity is coming from someone. So we have to condemn the fact that the ambassador was killed and what is done, you know, violence and all this. But what is very important, if you are supporting democracy uh, in the, the Muslim majority countries and in MENA and what, for example, after the President Barack Obama uh, talked to the, 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 the Arabs, you know, in his uh, uh, just after the, the uprisings, he was saying that he was was supportive of the people. That's mm -hmm. fine. Now we want to see things. And the first, there will be no stability, no real democratic uh, um, evolution or improvement in the region if we don't solve the problem between Palestine and Israel. And at the, at the end of the day, after four years, we haven't seen anything. The Palestine, it's just nothing is happening. It's the, the Palestinians are the lost people in the whole process of you know, democratization. This is one. The second is uh, the way we are dealing with uh, with you know the lack of consistency sometime when it comes to uh, our interests and once again this uh, silence when it comes to uh, uh, Syria now and as I'm talking to you every day 100 to 200 people are killed mm. in Syria mm. and we are we keep on talking in general terms about what we can do or not while when it was about uh, our interest in Libya we were very quick to do it so it's as if the blood of the mm -hmm. Syrians is less valuable than the oil of the Libyans so what could be done to keep one to 200 people uh, from being killed every day in Syria 
I, I think that there is something which is, you know, for example, the no-fly zone, much more economic pressure, uh, isolating the country and getting the support of the people who are ready to do this. And, and at the end uh, of the day, China and Russia, well, they were not happy because they lost Libya after there was this uh, no-fly zone. But I think that it much more can be done uh, to support. I'm not advocating uh, give weapon to the opposition because I have a problem with this. I, I really think that is, we are going towards a civil war that is going to last for a long time. But we are not using all our soft power, diplomatic power, economic power to put this to an end and to help the people to be freed from a dictator. Uh, Kasser, thank you for the call. Jeff in Madison, hi. Yeah, just a, just a cu- couple of comments. Um, a reality check, maybe, for our people outside of the Middle East. I was just in Cairo a couple of weeks ago for a, a United Nations humanitarian operations workshop dealing with Syria and other issues in the region, and uh, drove through Tahrir Square when I arrived. And this was this was just after the the craziness of the film uh, that was made here. And at the time. Yeah, you know, Tahrir Square was very peaceful in the, in midday. Uh, there were a couple dozen uh, Tyrenes quietly carrying signs of protest, as as we might do in Washington, and it looked very normal to me. Um, there was an interesting debate run by the BBC. I saw that was televised there uh, about this insulting film and the, and what had what it had provoked and caused. Um, there was a U.S. based civil rights lawyer who kept, uh, I must say, verbally pounding the table about how freedom of speech is a, is a sacred right. He kept using the word sacred uh, for Americans that the government cannot legislate, cannot diminish, and the world must understand this. And finally, there was an elderly Egyptian man who spoke up, I thought, very eloquently of the need for understanding on both sides and how both neither side was really communicating. And he talked about the need for both sides to understand that there are sacred aspects on both sides, obviously the the sacred religious aspects that were insulted on one side and the sacred civil rights on on the other side, on this side. And until, until his point was that until both sides can understand that there are sacred, there's a sacred aspect on both sides that was being um, misunderstood, then we will not reach understanding. But it, it, it was a fascinating debate. Mm. Just, just a comment. Yeah, no, I'm glad you called, Jeff. Tariq? Yes, I think that this is so, so you know, it's very important that uh, such, you know, uh, uh, comment and, 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 and witness uh, sh- witnesses, you know, should be made for all of us. Because at the end of the day, you know, when I was talking about this, what I said to the Muslims, take an intellectual critical distance. First, I don't want, for example, new laws against, you know, blasphemy and all this. I don't think it's going to, to change anything. At the end of the day, we have freedom. We want to keep our freedom. But we need to understand at the same time that anyone who is free should be responsible at the same time. So you have rights. So be reasonable with your rights and, and try to understand, uh, you know, the, the the sacred of the other, as it was said. I think that this is very important. And I, I, I'm saying to the Muslims, don't react. Ignore some of these provocations and and, and accept the, the reality of freedom of expression. Uh, at the same time, you know, uh, in, the, the, in Europe, uh, in the UK, I, I once responded to someone, you know, uh, you can ridicule the suffering of people, and you know, you know what was the suffering of Jewish people in Europe. And I think that uh, uh, this is something that we, we, you, it's legal to laugh about it, or to laugh at it. But it's not right. This is a, it's a, this has to do with decency. So the level of what was a trauma in the European conscience reach level of uh, uh, sacredness. It's, it's, it's sacred. It's just you don't touch this because you know how much it hurt uh, the, the, the European conscience uh, through uh, Nazism and all this. You don't laugh at the suffering of people, even though you can do it. Understand for the Muslims what is sacred in out of your uh, uh, historical trauma. It's for Muslims sacred out of religious reference and they are not used to laugh at this so now the muslims should understand that they live in uh, countries where it's possible they take they should take a, a critical distance but 
our fellow citizens should understand that sometimes you touch things that are very sensitive. You better watch what you are doing with your rights instead of transforming your rights into weapons to hurt people. I don't think that this is the way to live together. Can you uh, put this in the form of a person you wrote in the New York Times recently about Egypt's new president, uh, Mohamed Morsi, and his trying to rebut uh, the president of our country, Obama's uh, absolute defense of free speech at, at the United Nations. Um, how, how does this tension embody itself in the Egyptian president? I think you, we we have to understand that at the same time he's coming and he's he's not only talking to the United States or in the United it's the president. He's also talking to his own country, his own people, and all the Muslims around the world. Mm-hmm. And he wants to make it. He wanted to make it sure that the Muslims were hurt, and that this is not the way to deal with Muslims. So, so uh, this is exactly what the tension is. And that, then we, we, you can see that uh, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you, you, you are dealing with an issue, but you have to look at what is happening. And he is challenged from within uh, the President Morsi by the literalists and the populists that are pushing and pushing exactly the way the President Barack Obama is pushed by neocons uh, within the country and pushed in a way where he should show how much he is tough in order not to be perceived as uh, weak or betrayed betraying the U- U.S. values. So, so this is exactly mm. the same situation for all the presidents. We go in. We have a couple lines open. They've been busy. If you'd like to join our conversation, our number is 800-486-8655. Tariq Ramadan is joining us. His book is Islam and the Arab Awakening. He's a professor of Islamic studies at Oxford University. And we go to June next in Shawano. Hi, June. Hi, Kathleen. Good morning to your guest. I have found that this particular Arab uh, uprising is similar to what's going on in many places around the world. Spain is one in particular, and the Wall Street movement, Occupy movement, is also similar. Now, to someone who makes $5 a day in Egypt and worries about the price of bread. It, not, it may not be the same, but our young people have a similar thing. They've gone to school. They cannot get jobs. And corruption exists here as well. It's not spoken of by polite people in the average media, but many of our representatives are taking money called campaign contributions from large groups like Big Pharmacy. And I think that this is, in a way, a world movement. And uh, I know in my mid-70s I won't see it reach the point that I hope it will, but uh, I hope this happens. And your name touches me because I lived in Nigeria for 20 years and had many uh, people who uh religion was Islam and uh, uh joined them in their Ramadan festivals. Thank you very much. Thank for you, this, June. Uh yes, Kathleen. Thank you. Thanks for the call. Tariq. Yes, I think that, you know, uh, uh, I'm not sure I, heard, I, I understood the whole thing, but my, my sense out of this question is really to hope that, you know, uh, there is a national, transnational mobilization of people uh, asking for more dignity. And it's yes. true that uh, uh, what we, 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 we saw in Madrid, in Greece, uh, in Wall Street, are people saying, uh, that's not going to work like this. We, we want to be uh, respected. We want uh, human dignity to be respected. And, and it's true that, uh, you know, uh, through the last economic crisis, what we saw about the way people were treated, and especially in the United States, people losing their homes and losing their money because uh, uh, people were playing with money and, and, and trading and banks and, and all this. This is a system which is nurturing uh, uh, 
uh, and justice. And at the end of the day, you know, uh, I wrote a book on uh, philosophy of pluralism, and 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 my work here in Qatar is to work in a, a center for uh, ethics and and in different fields, and among them, of course, more ethics in politics and more ethics in in. I mean, and I think that this is why we have to come together instead of being, you know, obsessed with, you know, tiny differences and being uh, blind uh, and, and completely obsessed with this. I think it's right time for us to understand that when why I'm talking to you and, and listening to uh, to what I heard right now is is just this is what we want. We want people to have a dignified life, and and at the end, the Muslims who were in the streets in in Egypt, Tunisia, and who are are not happy, even the American Muslims that you have uh, among you and who are uh, uh, American and completely Americans, this is what they want. So at the end of the day, uh, this is my main question to, uh, for example, your President Barack Obama is not to treat the Muslims better, but to be consistent with the American values, to treat all the human beings the same way. Muslims are not Muslims, black or white, and Arabs are not, and not to be completely and blindly obsessed with geostrategic interests kindly supportive of Israel, because it's right time to say as well that Israel is not helping peace in the region and not helping to treat people with the common human dignity. This mm. is as simple as this, but we have to stand up and to say it. I find myself thinking about how the world would be different if we put ethics front and center, Tariq. It, exactly, would, be yes, it would be very different, wouldn't it? Yeah. It would be completely different and beyond our religious affiliation and spirituality. You know, I started my life traveling around the world and dealing with a liberation theologian in, in, in South America, Donel de la Camara, or with the Dalai Lama that I went to meet with him, and with Christians in Europe and Jews and everywhere. And at the end of the day, what I can say is that we agree on so many things about the ethical values and, and the ethical principles. Let us start with this. That we, we all start with, we need to protect human dignity, human freedom, and uh, 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 education for all. And, and if someone is telling me about would say, I know, I know that in the Muslim majority countries we have a problem with uh, women and there is a great deal of discrimination. But the way it's understood in the West is about the way they dress. And I would say it has nothing to do with the way they dress. If you want to act for human, for women's rights in any society, I have two questions. Do they have access to education? Do they have access to the job market? Mm -hmm. And no discrimination. I want for women exactly the, what I want for men. If they have the same skills and the same job, they have to have the same salary, which is not the case in the United States of America still. So we need to come to the true questions. And I can find people who are not from my religion, and they are Christians and Jews and atheists and agnostics and Buddhists and Hindus and, mm. and, 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 and whatever, but they come, we can come together. And I think that the essence of what I'm trying to say in the last book about what is happening in Muslim majority countries is to say, let us speak about ethics in politics. Let us speak about ethics in economy. Let us speak about ethics in education instead of being upset with, uh, uh, at the end, what is a, a battle of egos and power struggles. Hmm. Professor Tariq Ramadan is our guest this hour. He is joining us by phone from Qatar. He is a visiting professor and he is working at the Center for Ethics there. He is um, a professor of contemporary Islamic studies at Oxford University and he is president of the European think tank, European Muslim Network, which is located in Brussels. He's very much, as you can hear from this conversation, a man of the entire world. His latest book is Islam and the Arab Awakening. We're taking phone calls for him for a few more minutes. Our number is 800 486 Eight six five five. Email is talk at wpr dot org. Facebook page is the Kathleen Dunn Show. This is the Ideas Network of Wisconsin Public Radio. Our guest this hour is the author of Islam and the Arab Awakening, Tariq Ramadan, joining us by phone from Qatar, where he is at the Center for Ethics. Um, and we go to David in Ironwood, Michigan. Hi, David. Hello. It's so nice to hear someone who has a thing with ethics and stuff. I, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, another thing I just want to make a point is that the media, you know, so much is they're, they're running 
stories just to make a buck, quick buck, you know. And, you know, it seems like uh, stories that kind of inflame and have all this emotion in you know, get more higher viewerships and stuff. Instead of really, you know, concentrating on the ethics and stuff, they're just, you know, so much of the world media is concentrating on the you know, hot spots and stuff instead of, you know, making things better. Mm-hmm. Terry? Yes, I think we haven't talked about this, and it's good to to have a, a, a quick uh, uh, say about about media because I, I think that uh, very often we uh, uh, sit down and we criticize the media and the journalists for not doing their job. Uh, at the end of the day, I, I think that I am critical, but I am not naive, and, and and I also look at our own responsibility. At the end of the day, you know, uh, uh, the journalists are trying to give. Uh, the public, what the public is expecting, and very often the public is expecting and, and, and likes, uh, uh, um, you know, emotional things and controversies, and are not very much uh, uh, interested in, in complex issues. And, and, and for example, when we speak about ethics, it's not simple. It's, it's you know, ethics means effort, means obligation, means, you know, to, to, to understand your responsibility and your human responsibility. And we are in a vicious circle because the media are doing things for the public and the public likes controversies and then it, they, make, they make money out of this. And, and, and still, I really think that it's very important for the citizens and also for the journalists uh, to come to uh, and to understand that there are some journalists who are doing a very great, a very good job and the great things and and we have citizens who have to be much more involved in being vocal in the media uh, now we have alternative media we have for example a, a program like this one i think we can adjust it's not uh, a media it's not the mainstream media might uh, 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 make some money out of this controversy yes. at the end of the day is our our civic responsibility to resist journalists are citizens and us as citizens we have to resist and to come to an ethics of citizenship based on responsibility and commitment to some of our uh, shared values this mm. is the starting point instead of blaming the journalists let us find the right journalists the good journalists the good citizens who are doing it can do the job together. Mm -hmm. You have to examine our own souls, that's for sure. David, thanks very much for the call. Alan in Wapaka, hi. Hi, thank you. Um, last, well, I believe it was last week, you had uh, Salman Rushdie on, and he, uh, somebody called into the show that was upset, and, and I think he said, how could you write a book that would upset so many people? And, and this is a person I believe was in Wisconsin, and I thought, you know, I was thinking to myself, how can you miss so so far be so far off of the American values um, um, what we stand for is being able to say what you want and um, I, I think it's going both ways now we cannot criti criticize the Christian church in this country without being um, actually people coming after you as well and and I think People should be able to say what they want, no matter who they offend, and throw all the cards on the table and, and, and let that uh, let the truth come out that way. Um, I, I have friends that are Muslims. I don't see a difference between you know a person that's a Muslim, a person that's a Christian, or a person that's an atheist. They can all be good people, and they can all be good, bad people. And um, I think uh, we need to not let people hide behind religion to... Um, to uh, do things that are not good for society as a whole. I'll uh, take your answer off Thanks, there. Thanks, Alan. You. Thank you for the call. Uh, I, I think that the, the last thing that you said, or the last point you raised, it's an important one, is that let us start with the fact that we know that uh, citizens and with uh, uh, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, or uh, any background, they can come together and, and share principles about freedom of expression. I, I would start with this by saying uh, this is a principle that we have to cherish and that we uh, 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 and to have to we have to protect. Having said that, now. Uh, it's also important uh, sometimes in pluralistic society to be able to listen to people who may uh, uh, express
express their concerns and their disappointments when it comes to uh, what is said because they feel hurt. It doesn't mean that because they are saying this, they are not uh, uh, respecting the values that within the, the, the realm of freedom of expression, sometimes I can say, you, you know, I know and I will protect your right to say what you want to say, but you just have to listen. I, 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 don't, I, I don't feel good with it. Now, this is one point which is important. We should, in, in, uh, in the name of freedom, we should give the space to people to express their uh, feelings without letting the feelings imposing onto our legal system anything which is uh, uh, diminishing our right to, to speak. And I agree with what was said now. Uh, now, you know, I was one who clearly took a clear position when the, 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 we had this fatwa against Salman Rushdie saying, I didn't like what I read, but I was against the fatwa and I was for his uh, freedom uh, to be able to say this. And it was a fiction and, and we have to respect this. So let us, instead of just reacting in such a way, say, if we want to live together, if we want to build the pluralistic society in the, uh, in, in the United States of America or anywhere uh, in, in the West or, or even in Muslim-majority countries, it's all about protecting our rights and all together being educated. Mm. And Tariq, we have to say goodbye at that moment. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. It was just a really Thanks good hour. Thank you. We hope you'll join us again. <laughs> Tariq Ramadan, um, our guest, his book is Islam in the Arab Awakening. I love doing this show, but that was a those were really worthwhile hours, don't you think? I, I, those are good hours. Uh, thanks to Rhonda Fanning and to Brett Jaspers, who produced this program. And thanks for all of your calls. Uh, just a reminder, tonight at 8 o'clock, the second presidential debate, where we hope there will be conversation about ethics. Why not? And tomorrow, we are broadcasting live. Please join us. I'm there, and the Joy Cardine Show will be there as well tomorrow at the Pabst. It's at the Pabst Cudahy Pub, which is, you can see right on the street, 144 East Wells Street. We have a terrific lineup of guests, Joy's show, my show, and we'd love to have you be with us to talk about what you heard tonight, to talk about the political season, to have some pastries, to have some coffee, to meet us. It's tomorrow, starting at 6, running till 11.